His work was also quoted during two presidential impeachment trials. He regularly appears on TV, including NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, and BBC, and is also a frequent guest on NPR and other syndicated radio programs. He has published commentaries in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and other leading national publications. Without further ado, Professor Josh Blackman. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, you know, I booked a hotel to stay here in Phoenix. I picked the Renaissance. Guess who's staying there? The president. Um, so my trip here is a little bit hectic. It's actually not even the first time this has happened this summer. I was in Utah over the summer in Park City, and who shows up but Biden also. So for some reason, I just attract him. Maybe he attracts me. I don't know, but that's that's how Fetzak rolls, I guess. Um, the topic today is one that's kind of significant if you're a judge. Now, how many of you ever either clerk for a judge or intern for a judge or work for a judge? Okay, some hands went up. Now, as I'm sure you all know, as a judge, as a law clerk, you take an oath to the Constitution, right? No question about that. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. What about the U.S. Supreme Court? Do lower court judges take an oath to the Supreme Court? Not the last time I checked. It's not in the Supremacy Clause. It's not there. But as a matter of course, over the last 200 years, it seems at least that the U.S. Supreme Court has been deemed supreme. And that all the courts are, as the name suggests, inferior, are beneath the U.S. Supreme Court. That's both the lower federal courts and the state Supreme Courts. So as a general matter, if there's a Supreme Court precedent and you are a lower court judge, um, you're stuck, right? You're obligated to follow that precedent. Now, what if you're an originalist? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. But let's say that you favor a reading of the Constitution that's consistent with original meaning. I'll give you a newsflash. Many decisions of the Supreme Court are not originalist. Right? Many decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court are, we might call living constitutionalist, they might be called preposterous or preposterous maybe, right? They're, they're, they're whatever. Can a lower court judge say, you know what, my oath is to the Constitution, I'm just going to ignore the entire decisions of the Warren Court and just go on my own. Uh, that's a good recipe to get impeached, right? You don't want to do that. But that's not the end of the story. Right? The topic of my talk today is how lower court judges can work within the confines of two constraints. Stare decisis, that is the need to stand by precedent, and originalism, that is that you follow the original meaning of the Constitution. Right? Again, we take an oath to the Constitution. We all do that. You will as lawyers, you will if you're a judge. Uh, we don't take an oath to the Supreme Court. So that's the theme today, right? Now, keep in mind that what I'm talking about here is about the federal constitution. Um, I am not talking about the state constitution. If any of you will be clerking on the state courts, you have your own document. In fact, the Arizona constitution is one of the most interesting ones in the country. It's got a lot of provisions that are sort of very unique. They're, they're tailored to the experiences of the people of Arizona. Uh, uh, in fact, your state Supreme Court often interprets it. So I do not mean to disrespect your constitution at all. But my focus here is on the federal constitution. As I'm sure most of you know, and I love this, as my co-author Randy Barnett wrote a book called Restoring the Lost Constitution, the document under glass at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., right, the, the, the constitution, it's been there. It's under glass. No one's taken a little scalpel and cut various parts out. But if you read the Supreme Court's decisions, they kind of did. I said, we're not going to look at this part. We're going to ignore this part. They took a little Sharpie and scribbled about this one. They made up numbers, emanations, all this other stuff, right? So the Constitution that we have today, as interpreted by the court, is not the same document that's under glass in the National Archives, right? Over the course of decades upon decades, the court has built up precedents interpreting the Constitution. Okay. Now, more recently, at least the last 20 years or so, the Supreme Court said, all right, we've gone pretty far. We're not going to go further, right? The current court, the Roberts Court, the enterprise, the, the mission of this court is not to 
sort of overrule 200 years of precedent. That's not their mission. They're going to take some more recent precedents and maybe particularly uh, extreme, Roe, Grutter, among others, perhaps. Well, what the court's really trying to do is say, okay, we're going to just hit the brakes. We've gone pretty far in the past. We're not going further, right? Okay. To use a phrase that comes up in litigation by the Affordable Care Act, this far but no farther, right? Maybe Congress has been given the power to regulate wheat that never leaves a farm, which would be Phil Byrne. And maybe they can regulate barbecue food that never leaves a restaurant. That's cat's back and bung. But they can't regulate the decision to not buy health insurance. That was the Obamacare case, the ACA case, right? So what the court's saying is we're going to just sort of put a limit on how far the court has gone from the original meaning of the Constitution. And this would be called perhaps the gravitational pull of originalism. I promise this is not a science lecture. I do like some analogies, right? That no matter what you do, no matter how much of a judge you are that loves to sort of expand federal power, to expand rights, whatever you want to do, you just know in the back of your head, it's like, oh, well, I know this is not exactly the right thing to do, that there's this constitution, it's got a fixed meaning, fixation, and it's sort of pulling us closer. And so always lurking in the background is this pull of originalism. But that's what happens on the Supreme Court, right? If you're an originalist justice in the Supreme Court, sky's the limit. You can do lots of things. I'll give you an example. There was a case from 2019 called Garza versus Idaho. If you didn't study it, that's fine. It was not a very high profile case. Um, this case involves Strickland against Washington. Everyone about Strickland? Okay. Strickland was a very important decision from the 1980s, 1984 which held that if a lawyer provides ineffective assistance of counsel, again, if a lawyer provides ineffective assistance of counsel, it actually might be grounds to vacate a conviction, right? Now there's a test, it has to fall below some sort of objective standard and the, uh, 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 the error must be prejudicial to the, the defense, okay? This is a very important decision. If any of you ever do habeas work or you do any sort of a, a pellet review, Strickland will come up because no matter what happens, any criminal defendant says, my lawyer screwed up. He was the worst, right? He, he will find, you throw the lawyer to the bus and have, you know, no matter what happens. It, it will happen in every case, I promise. But is there any actual basis for Strickland? The Constitution says they have a right to counsel. Sure. Uh, does the government have to pay for that? Well, Miranda at least created a right that the government has to pay for your lawyer. And then the court sort of made up another right. Not only does the government have to pay for your lawyer, the lawyer must provide effective assistance. None of that at all is based on the Constitution. So it's just a good practice. It's a good idea, perhaps. Some people think it helps with the criminal justice system. I'm not here to argue about that. Probably does. But this is all just sort of made up stuff. No basis in the Constitution. So then we get to the Garza case. And the Garza case applied Strickland to a new context, right? And it has to do with a very particular issue, right? What happens if a criminal defendant signs an appeal waiver? That is, he says, I'm going to plead guilty. As part of my guilty plea, I will waive any appeals. All right. What happens if the lawyer advising him screwed up? And the lawyer gave him bad advice. Oh, yeah, you should sign this. And it turns out that was really bad advice. Can they go back and appeal it? So this is not exactly the issue with Strickland, but sort of like an extension of what was at Strickland, right? It's, it's the advice was, yeah, you should sign this appellate waiver. And it turns out that was really bad advice because it, 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 it knocked out any future review of his decisions. Okay? So we go to Garza. What does the court do? Well, you might say if you're an originalist, you say, you know what, forget this. Let's just overrule Strickland and move on. But no one actually called the court to overrule Strickland, not even, not even the government, right? Not even Idaho wants to overrule Strickland. And generally, the Supreme Court can't be in the business of overruling cases no one's asked to overrule. That, that, that's a pretty basic principle. Yet, Justice Thomas wrote a dissent which was joined by Justice Gorsuch. Okay. 
Now, Gorsuch and Thomas, they thought that the defendant should lose for a host of reasons which are not important here. But Thomas also sort of explained, what do you do with Strickland? What do you do with a precedent that was just sort of made up? <coughs> so Thomas wrote, if there is little evidence suggesting that certain precedents are correct as in original matter, the court should tread carefully, the court should tread carefully before extending our precedents in this area. What does that mean? Again, he's not saying we overrule Strickland. What he's saying is we should limit Strickland to the facts presented. We should not extend it to new context, for example, the appellate waiver in this decision. Okay. So what happens? According to the dissenters, we don't we don't push Strickland further this far, but no farther. Okay, we should not be moving away from the original meaning of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. And again, the Sixth Amendment says your right to counsel it does not have to be effective. It says nothing about whether your lawyer is good or not. If you have a bad lawyer, you have an action in tort or something, right? Or malpractice. The remedy is not to have your conviction vacated. Um, if I could use an analogy from torts, you might remember this. Remember this one, right? Yeah. Um, imagine you have a row of townhouses, right? You have you know this one in torts, right? And one of them's on fire. And in order to save all the other houses in the row, you demolish one house in the middle. Do you, do you say this in torts? Right. The question is, what do you do if something's really bad and it threatens to spread and afflict others? Well, you kind of just limit it right there. And that's why I see the U.S. reports, right? A lot of the U.S. reports is a dumpster fire. A lot of it's just not good, right? There are parts of it that have no basis in the Constitution or history. Let it burn. Let it be there. You can't stop that fire, but prevent it from spreading to other doctrines of the law. I think that's the, if I could distill my thesis into one picture, it's that. Uh, as grotesque as it is. Okay. Um, now, when, with regard to the lower courts, and even the state Supreme Courts, right? States have power. And I realize I should have the Arizona seal up there. I apologize, I don't. Uh, it's a very pretty seal. Uh, so that, that, that's mea culpa, my, my, my apologies. I, I, I noticed in the plane right over, I didn't get a chance to, to get the slide fixed. I was like, oh no, I forgot Arizona. Um, that background brings us to what I call the three moves. So if you're a law clerk or if you're an aspiring judge, Here's how you can sort of operationalize what I'm discussing here, okay? And this might be a little bit technical, but I, th I think it'll I think it'll click once I get to the third point. What? But what is this? I, what What are they doing to your students? You need these, these, these sticks on, on chains. It's just anyone know what this is? It's just, okay. What's that? I lower the bar every day, so that's, that's I don't I don't need that thing. <laughs> All right, um, so the first move, we have to ask a question. We ask ourselves, is this Supreme Court precedent, and look my words carefully, completely unmoored from original meaning, completely unmoored, right? Look, I am not saying if I am Justice Thomas, I'm gonna say, oh, that's not originalist, and this is not originalist. There are lots of opinions that are not exactly originalist, but at least they, they make an effort to talk about history. Okay, this should be a deferential standard. A mixed decision that relies on both originalist and non-originalist justifications, that's out, right? You only get to the Thomas framework if there's some written opinion that was just fabricated whole cloth. And I often use Griswold, the emanations and the penumbras as an example, because it, it is. It, it is a validly decision that's sort of just made up, that, that, that they acknowledge that there's, that there's not really anything there. It's just we're just going to do it because we can, okay? Um, this is a hard standard to satisfy, but there are probably cases that fit the bill. All right. All right. What's the second move? Again, this is a deferential standard. Does your case require the extension? That's a key word with my little tape measure, right? The extension of non-originalist precedent. 
if they're asking to extend the precedent, you let the townhouse burn, but you don't spread it further, right? A Supreme Court precedent with no basis in the Constitution is one value. It's still a precedent, right? You're not ignoring the precedent. Give it all of its weight, but not an inch more. Now, this, I think, is actually the most difficult of the three steps because it's not always obvious if the law is being asked to be ext extended. Because often what happens is the plaintiff says, no, Your Honor, my position is supported squarely by long-standing precedent. Oh, you'll hear this a million times. If you're ever the plaintiff's lawyer, you always say, no, Your Honor, this is easy. This is a simple application of precedent. There's no, there's no modification needed. That's what you want to say if you're the plaintiff, right? What does the defendant say? The opposite. Your Honor, this is a radical extension of precedent going far beyond what's been done before, and you cannot countenance this change. You, know, you guys are in moot court. You, you can do it much better than I can, right? But that's always what happens. So if there's even a conflict, if the plaintiff can get up in the stand and say with some honesty, Your Honor, we are applying squarely precedent, then what I'm talking about doesn't matter. But in the Garza case, they were asked for something new. The plaintiff said, yes, we realize there's a circuit split on this issue, and we're asking the Supreme Court to resolve this issue. But that's new. And very often, litigants will go to court saying, Your Honor, you know, I am preserving an issue. I realize there's precedent against us. We want to seek Supreme Court review. Those are the easy cases, right? Those are the easy ones. The lawyer says it. Um, but that's going to be the rare one, right? And again, if it's unclear whether an extension is being requested, you don't do what I'm talking about. You just sort of you follow the precedent. All right, so you got step one. Again, is the precedent completely unmoored from original understanding? Step two, does the case require an extension of non-originals precedent? Okay. Everybody step three? Yeah, step three. So it's always a three step. Or is it a seven step? No, it's usually a seven step. I have three steps. Much easier, right? If you want to acknowledge a higher power, it's a lot easier, okay? The, the, the third move, the third step is your home free. If you've proven that the decision, the precedent of the Supreme Court is non-originalist, and you've demonstrated that the parties are asking you to extend the precedent, you're not constrained anymore. Maybe you are, but I don't think you are. You can resolve the case from first principles. And this is my favorite Scalia picture. He's doing a nice Italian salute to everybody. Uh, uh, that's what he says, the living constitution. You don't know what that means? With the... Nick, tell them. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I grew up in Staten Island, so this is just what everyone, the people say hello in Staten Island. Um, so we, <laughs> I'm, I'm in Arizona. Okay, I'll get up to my pop, pop culture references. Okay. Uh, where the original meaning of the Constitution does not support the plaintiff's novel claim, do what Thomas says. The court should defer to the states and the federal government that are capable of making the policy determinations to resolve the question. Right. If, in fact, there's no original precedent on point and they're asking for some extension, some new thing, you can go from first principles. You can be an originalist, even the lower courts. All right. So next, I want to show you some examples, three examples, always three, I guess. I don't know why there are three. There's always three examples of how some judges have done this. And I actually have uh, one opinion from your circuit. Uh, Case called NLRB versus International Association of Bridge and Iron Workers from 19, I'm sorry, 2020 uh, by Judge Bumate. It was a dissent. Uh, case from my hometown of Texas, uh, Texas versus Reddick uh, from 2021 by Judge uh, Jim Ho, also a dissent. A lot of dissents, you know, as, as you can tell. And third one is from my circuit I clerked in, which was the Sixth Circuit by Judge Bush called Cleveland, I'm sorry, preterm Cleveland versus McLeod. Okay. And I just want to show you how these judges went about sort of being lower court originalists. And so this is Judge Bumate. He wrote this separate opinion. He said, I write separately to emphasize my views on why the Supreme Court's decision in IBEW is not binding in this case and why it is our duty to apply the Constitution and not extend precedent. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And he sort of walks through and says, our fidelity is to the Constitution. Okay. And when you have precedent that's been eroded by more recent jurisprudence, you have to reconsider it. 
So I think Judge Bumate here is saying very clearly, we don't need to extend 60 or 70 year old Supreme Court precedent to novel facts. If that precedent is just sort of made up. Um, the next opinion one is by Judge Ho from the Fifth Circuit. And he says, quoting Garza, where precedent is seriously questioned as an original matter or under current Supreme Court doctrine, courts should tread carefully before extending it. Sensing a pattern here, right? We can take care not to unduly expand precedents by reading them in light of text and history and so on. Okay. So too is Supreme Court decisions. If a faithful reading of precedent shows it is not directly controlling, the rule of law may dictate confining the precedent rather than extending it further. Again, you, you don't want to tell us to burn down the entire block. Okay, a little bit more from Judge Ho. Uh, fidelity to the Constitution requires much more than this. Critical features of the delegation challenge here make it categorically different from and unsupported under current precedent. Okay, here's a key thing. If we are forced to choose between upholding the Constitution and extending precedent in direct conflict with the Constitution, the choice should be clear. Our duty is to apply the Constitution, not extend precedent. Okay, so you we're know, sort of on the same page. And then we have Judge Bush. This was in uh, a case from uh, a, a Cleveland. And the court says we should be reluctant to extend jurisprudence in the absence of court decisions. They says lower court judges don't have the license to adopt a cramped reading of a case to rule it. Nor are we permitted to create razor-thin distinctions to evade precedent's grasp. Who's that? Oh, that's me. Yeah, he cited me. That, that's fine. That's not where I put, put there, but to show that at least some judges are at least picking up on this process. Uh, if you want a string cite for a brief, this is it. <laughs> kind of all squeezed into one. But I sort of keep track of judges who are applying the Justice Thomas Garza framework. And I won't say it's catching on, but I do my part to sort of spread the, spread the gospel, if I will. Okay, now there's some benefits. Always with, oh, with three. There are three, three benefits, I suppose, okay? Maybe three vices as well, but at least three, three virtues of low court originalism. Um, the first is if judges behave, if judges act as originalists, lawyers will take the hint. Market forces work. If law firms see that judges are doing something, then lawyers will emulate it, okay? But... Originals briefing can't be cobbled together haphazardly. Um, lawyers of all stripes need to improve their ability to develop originals arguments. Uh, in an ideal world, the law firms would be recruiting originalist law students. Hasn't happened quite yet, but it should happen at some point uh, as people take notice of how judges are behaving. Uh, I think another benefit is actually law schools. Um, now, you guys are lucky. You have Professor Worman here. You have a very good faculty. Not all schools have originals in the faculty. It doesn't exist. Uh, so many law students have to apply to, for example, the Originalism Seminar from Georgetown and elsewhere. Um, these are very useful projects and very useful programs to attend to learn how to be a good Originalist law clerk, how to be a good Originalist associate. And this one's actually my favorite. One of the biggest benefits of Originalist law court judges is it trickles up, not just down, it goes up to the Supreme Court. Um, if the Supreme Court keeps seeing all these lower court original decisions, they're going to have to take note and they're going to have to review them. And they're going to have to actually say, no, you're wrong. This original is not this way. Oh, you're right. This is good original, right? It forces the court to engage in this uh, arena of ideas that they don't have to in the past. Every single time the court says cert granted, that's taking this issue on head first. All right. I told you the three problems. Here are the three problems with low code originals. I don't want to uh, trivialize these. One is there's just not enough briefing, right? Uh, lawyers are busy. You'll know this if you don't already know this. You get paid by the hour. <laughs> we are paid hourly. And unless your clients want to pay you X hours to go do originals work, you're probably not going to do it for fun. So as a result, you brief the best you can, but you may not have the strongest originals briefing. Now there's ways around this. This was a case from the Sixth Circuit also where I clerked by Judge Amul Thapar, where he actually ordered the parties to do supplemental briefing on the meaning of, in this case, cases or controversies. Look at corpus linguistics. Uh, you, know, you know what corpus linguistics is? Um, this is sort of newish. Corpus linguistics is using a very big database of language to figure out what words mean. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, but again, 
even if the parties don't have sufficient briefing, it can always come back to the court to request it. To, 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 to the word is instruct, but really the word is order. Uh, you're ordered to file briefs. Now, what happened here is actually significant. Um, the Department of Defense, uh, the Defense, Department of Justice, actually put together a pretty decent brief providing the court instruction on corporate linguistics. The lawyer for the defendant basically said, yeah, it's not helpful. Corpus linguistics won't help you. Wrong answer. The court wanted it, and you don't tell a judge what you want is unhelpful, but you know, at least I guess it was you were honest. Um, the second problem, again, is this will burden attorneys, right? You're all going to be paid hourly. Uh, you don't have a limited time, and this is effort you have that may not actually pay dividends. So I think judges should be sympathetic to these sorts of things. Now, one proposal um, is from Judge Rudofsky, uh, who's a federal judge in Little Rock, Arkansas, which I think is actually very creative. And he encourages originals briefing through amicus briefs, as friend of the court briefs. And he says, if you are a junior attorney and you put together one of these briefs, I'm going to guarantee you argument time. So one of the good things that lawyers want is to argue in court. And you don't always get that as a junior associate. So what the court's saying is, I'm going to use incentives. If you take the time to prepare this brief, I'll give you argument time. And this can be done by a clinic. This can be done by, by, by you know, a, a, a public interest group like a Goldwater or an IJ group, right? There are many ways of doing originals briefing. But I think courts have to be willing to receive it. Um, there's another cost that may not be obvious. Oops, sorry, I went too far. There's another cost that may not be obvious to you all, but I think it's actually very significant, which is collegiality. If you're in a court, you're on what's called a multi-member body. You're not an island unto yourself. You have to work closely with other people. And let's say you're in an appellate court with three judge panels, or even a state supreme court with five or seven members. Every time you say, wait a minute, I want to write a 30-page dissent on originalism, that may annoy your colleagues. They may say, why are you wasting my time with this crap, right? We have a Supreme Court decision that's good enough. Stop with this original stuff, right? And also, when you write a dissent, guess what? Majority has to respond to it, and that's more work for them. Or let's say that there's a majority opinion circulated, and you send like you know a 20-page memo saying, "I like your opinion, but here's some original points to consider." Right? That also may annoy your colleagues. And I don't want you to be oblivious to this. When you're in a multi-member court, each case is decided as part of a long pattern of practices that you work together. And the more one judge alienates another judge, that may make it harder to uh, form a majority in a different case, right? It all works together. If you guys are a law firm and you piss off your partners, you can go to another firm, right? If, you, if two partners don't like each other, they move on. But if you're on a member of a state Supreme Court, you can't go to another Supreme Court. <laughs> I guess you can resign or do something else, but you're basically stuck with those people. Especially on the Supreme Court. That's why they have to all love each other. At least they say they love each other. I don't think they really do. But, oh, we, we love each other. And yeah, they have no choice, right? You're going to be working with the same eight people for the rest of your life. Uh, the turnover is very low. <coughs> so I think, you know, always judges should be sort of attentive and attuned to these sort of collegial factors. But again, at bottom, the oath they take is to the Constitution and not to the court. All right. That's all I have. Uh, happy to receive some questions, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, the short answer is yes. You need to be a practicing attorney to submit an amicus brief. You can't, you, you, you can't submit a brief pro se. Um, now, I'll just give a caveat. You're, you're all law students. You're a little bit better than pro se. Most law students have the availability of a supervising attorney. And most courts will let three L's submit motions, submit briefs under the supervision of a practicing attorney. I don't know what the rule is in Arizona. Every state has a rule. If you have a certain number of credits, you can take certain classes, you can you get a three L license. You have something like that here. Yeah, every state has. I just I don't know what the rules are. 
So it's a pretty good odds that your own state would allow it. One of the bigger challenges, though, is how to even know when to do it. And uh, uh, the Fifth Circuit's actually putting together a page where they sort of list all these sort of originalist cases where they want briefing in. Um, you know, if, unless you're checking notifications, you may not even see this request. So I at least try to publicize my blog when courts ask for it. Uh, but I think it's actually very, very useful. Um, the other issue for amicus briefs, you may not know this, usually you need consent from the parties, right? Because think of it this way. If, you know, you have a plaintiff, you have a defendant, if you want to put a brief in, you have to ask the party's consent. And if they don't give you consent, the judge will probably decline it. You say, well, why would any party ever decline consent? They don't want to help the other side, <laughs> right? If you're going to put in a good amicus brief in favor of the plaintiff, why would the defendant allow that? In fact, it's more work for them. They have to respond to it. They have to address it and so on. It's easier just to strike the brief altogether. So the, um, uh, the short answer is, if you're in a clinic or some group like that, you can seek leave to an amicus brief. What Judge Rudowski did is thing is actually very significant. He basically said is, I'm going to give leave, right? I want these briefs. And so you can imagine that um, lawyers will not decline leave with the judge as he wants these briefs to be submitted. A good question. Yes. Right. So, with, so usually Justice Thomas takes a YOLO approach to precedent, as some might say, right? It's let's overrule everything and just leave me alone, right? It presses, sorry, decisis doesn't matter. But Justice Gorsuch isn't quite there. So I think in some regards, the Gar's opinion was Gorsuch telling Thomas, all right, if you want to get more than one vote, here's what you can do, right? You can sort of temper down your sort of um, hostility towards sorry, decisis and at least say, we're not going to overrule certain precedents. Because even Scalia would often say some precedents are what he called water under the bridge. They're not going anywhere. You know, uh, Scalia would say that about, about Griswold, for example. He's like, look, Griswold is there. No one's going to overrule it. Thomas says, hold my beer. Uh, that's what Kavanaugh says, right? But, but, <laughs> but Justice Thomas was willing to say we should overrule Griswold. I think that's the difference between Thomas and, 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 and uh, Gorsuch and, and the others on the court. Uh, but, but practically, right, you know, the abortion cases, those are rare, right? It's far more likely to have a sort of a mundane criminal procedure issue that actually can actually make a difference by sort of constraining it like that. I think it's some sort of influence of torture why they have this. Thing. It's bizarre. All right, what else we have? What other questions we have? Yeah. Uh, I guess a question is also this. The uh, upholding institution of the Supreme Court coming up the fact of why you should maintain um, precedent and sorry decisis, is, is there room for that argument against lower courts continuing to have a duty to uphold Right. So, right. So, I, I don't. I don't for a minute think that John Roberts likes this presentation. Right. Um, yeah. No. I mean, he, he doesn't. I, he doesn't like me in general. But I think. I think for a minute he would like this presentation in particular because if you take the view that the Supreme Court is indeed supreme, then every every word the Supreme Court says should be treated as scripture, right, and should be followed to the letter of the law. Um, that's an opinion, and I think it's certainly true. I don't think the Constitution commands it. Um, and if the court is actually engaging in reasoned decision making, as I described, then then you're gonna, you are going to follow the opinion. It's only the really radical cases that have no basis in law; those ones that can be sort of constrained. Uh, but but you yeah, know, I, I do take the legitimacy point uh, to heart. And if you have all these sort of these young gun judges saying, "Okay, you know what? This opinion is not more than this opinion extension. We're going to just do our own thing," that could have some blowback. And, and I can tell you, I I present. The same lecture I gave to you all, I present this to judges. I give the same talk to a room full of 30 originalist judges. Um, at least they say they're originalists. And not all of them are eager to do it. In fact, most of them don't. And I think a lot of it's a collegiality. They don't upset their colleagues. But never forget how much that factors into decisions. Like when a when you don't get a judge rule, they think the way he's going to rule, it probably because someone upsets colleagues. Trust me on this one. Um, judges don't like being booed. They don't like being negative tweets about them. They don't like having mean posts on, on, on Slate about them, right? Judges, they're, they're very, look, if you're a judge, you're there for a reason because you really care people think about you, right? It's the opposite of what you would think, right? If you're truly independent, you haven't made enough friends to be a federal judge, right? If you really don't give a damn people think, you've not done the, the, the butt kissing, if you will, to actually become a federal judge. People actually get up there, they're good for a reason. 
because they've been gracious with a lot of people and they've, they've achieved power. So it's utterly unsurprising that people get there are not willing to sort of rock the apple cart and to sort of disturb precedent. So I think that the legitimacy point is probably secondary to how the judge will look in the eyes of their colleagues saying, well, why are you flagging the Supreme Court? I'm not flagging, I'm just distinguishing. And then people say, oh, that's not a, that's not a real distinction. So I, I anticipate that and I make it clear that you should be very hesitant to pull the guards with trigger. That'd be a really easy, a really clear case we pull this trigger. But thank you for the question. What else? Yes. The point that you just made about there's a lot of brown nosing that goes into securing a federal appointment and that being at odds with the original prescription for what judges should be. How do we as a culture go about disrupting that and getting back to what would be a first principle of independence of judges? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I have very cynical thoughts on, the, on this. I mean, if you just look at, I mean, you, you have one ninth circuit seat that Trump had in uh, Arizona, and the number of jostling that went into that seat with McCain and the White House, they hated each other, and the people lobbying and this and that. And then you got someone, okay, whatever, right? Um, in Texas, where I live, the amount of fighting, there were three appointments. We had Judge Willett, Judge Ho, and Judge Oldham, we had three circuit court nominees. The amount of fighting and infighting and sort of politicking to get there was just staggering. And a lot of people who were very qualified were just sort of left out on the side. So you only even see who sort of winds up as like the finish line, the top three or four candidates. You never see the people who were sort of knocked out at the beginning. Um, you know, you think of Justice Kavanaugh, right? Why on earth was it him? Right? I mean, he was passed. He, he was a fellow, federal judge. He worked in the White House. It was a very complex confirmation hearing. The second hearing was a train wreck, right? I mean, anyone else who got confirmed by a much larger margin. Why him? Because the politics were there, that he had made the friends, he had the connections. I don't know how to break that cycle, right? You know, you always think of, you know, if nominated, I would not run. If, if I am elected, I would not serve, you know, the, the, you know, the, the great speech. And I don't think a judge could actually pull that one off. So, you know what? I will not be a Supreme Court justice. If you nominate me, I will not take it. I do not want this job. And then they'll just take it since they get nominated, right? I don't know if you can do that. Um, my answer how to sort of correct go back to first principles is not going to be a fun answer, but it's true. The only way to make the federal judiciary less controversial is to make them less powerful. So long as judges serve and liberal, so long as judges have the power to change national policy overnight by themselves, you better be damn sure it's an important job that people are going to lobby for, that they're going to fight over, right? Forget about nationwide injunctions. Forget about Chevron. I don't get it. All that stuff is second, right? If you have federal judges who can turn national policy on the dime by writing an opinion, it's going to be important. The only way to make that less important is to reduce their power. Uh, you could strip jurisdiction. Right, you could you could you could limit their power to declare laws unconstitutional. You do lots of things. I don't think any of these are actually good. So I, I almost prefer the, the the status quo, which is not very good, to the alternative where we have an emasculated judiciary. I think that would actually be significantly worse. I didn't answer your question at all. I'm sorry, but but I, I think about these issues a lot. And uh, if nothing else, when we're picking judges, the uh, the brown noses, to use your to use your 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 turn of phrase, uh, should be kept far away. But that will never happen because those are the ones who know how to work the system. And I, I told my friend earlier, I, I went to law school in DC. I hate DC. It's an awful place. Anyone ever spent time in DC? It's, it's awful, right? You grew up there. So oh, God, where? <laughs> you got out. Good. Don't go back. I mean, when you, when you, look, I, I love Texas, right? I love being not in DC. When you go to DC, you meet someone, first question they ask you, what do you do? Right? Why are they asking, what do you do? They're not curious. They want to know, what can you do for me? Who are you? How important are you? Are you above or below my station? Is it worth talking to you? Trust me on this one. Spend five, she's not. Spend five minutes on Capitol Hill. You go, oh, who do you work for? What do you do? You know, oh, where'd you go to law school? You know, yeah, it's like a regiment of questions. And and that's because again, it's it's about access. And if you're if you're if your guy gets nominated, you have access to him. Like all the former law clerks want their guy to get nominated to the court. It's it's really an incestuous network. And I don't know how to break it. Uh, I see. So I didn't clerk in the Supreme Court. I have no idea. I never even tried. Uh, but I sort of looked at from the outside. Yeah, but I, I grew up in New York City. I went to law school in DC. I hate both places. I'm very happy to be out of those uh, the East Coast. Yes. Uh, I just think you write an article 
Yeah. Yep. Yep. And yeah. All right, so uh, Will Bowe is a very distinguished scholar in Chicago. It's a very good friend as well. We had our disagreements, but we still get along quite well, I think. Um, the question about liquidation. Uh, what is liquidation? Well, there are different ways of interpreting the Constitution, right? One is we say, what is the original meaning of the Constitution? Now it's fixed in 1788, and nothing can change after the fact, right? Now, unless you amend the Constitution, that's it. It's under glass. We're done. There's another theory that looks to practice of the elected branches. That is, if there's some long-standing practice, let's say the president does something every year, and then Congress takes no action to stop them. Okay. The president keeps doing something of dubious constitutionality, and the Congress says, yeah, that's fine. That counts for something, perhaps. And what you say is with liquidation, that this practice, this ongoing, long-standing, unchallenged practice liquidates, or basically uh, uh, supplements, if you will, the meaning of the Constitution. So to use an example that, that didn't quite work, uh, let's say recess appointments, right? The Constitution doesn't really say how long a recess has to be to make recess appointment. It doesn't say. And let's say there's some tradition for, for 200 years, presidents keep making recess appointments during these three-day breaks in the, in the Senate very short three-day breaks. And the Congress has nothing to stop it. That might be some evidence that three days is the right number. Uh, now, that didn't actually happen, the fact that, that didn't, the three-day limit didn't even happen to the Obama presidency. So I'm giving you an easy example to remember. Now, the question, I, I have a love-hate relationship with liquidation. And the reason why is it allows lazy people to get away from original meaning, right? It's so you say, well, there's this practice. We don't need to figure out what the original meaning is. Let's just do what they've done before. Well, maybe they were doing it wrong, right? Um, and I think a lot of the things people say have been liquidated really haven't been liquidated. A lot of, they say, oh, there's an executive practice, which is not usually as clean as people think it is. And I think the Noel Cannon case I mentioned with recent appointments is evidence. Scalia's concurrence, really dissent, makes clear that there is no liquidation at this point, even though Breyer says it is. Uh, to use the analogy, remember adverse possession and each property also. Remember adverse possession, that if you keep squatting on a piece of land for 10 years, 20 years, and the owner knows you're there, and you keep squatting and it becomes yours, you get the fee simple, that's basically liquidation, right? It's constitutional amendment through, 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 through adverse possession. If you keep doing the wrong thing over and over, and eventually that becomes the right thing. Now, how many of you like adverse possession agree with it properly? I never did. I was like, this is, this is wrong. This is not right. You got this guy squatting. Why does he get it? So, you know, I, I love Will, but liquidation doesn't sit that well with me. Uh, but it, it is, I think, a valid theory of constitutional change. I think I did that right. Well, okay. We're having a thing now with Section 3 of insurrection, but we're cool. All right. What other questions you got? Uh, once? Yes. I, I think the advice your career services office will give is take whatever job you can get. Um, that's not the advice Josh will give you, right? I think, I think a clerkship, and not just an internship, internships or whatever, that's a short-term thing for a semester. A federal clerkship or a state clerkship is a very intimate relationship. Uh, you will work in the trenches of that judge in ways you don't even know, right? And I don't care what bench you're on, something big will blow up where you have to do something that's not clear, right? If it's a trial court, there's no record you're making up as you're going along. If there's an appellate court, you might get an emergency appeal that comes to you at the three o'clock in the morning. You know, we all, you will have those cases. If you're at the state Supreme Court, you know, that's a court of last resort. So I definitely think when you're, if you had the luxury of picking a judge to clerk for, which none of us do, to try to find someone who you're ideologically and philosophically sympathetic to. 
Um, now, some judges actually want what we call a counterclaim. Scalia would always hire one liberal clerk, not every year, almost every year. And the idea is, I want this person to challenge me, to challenge my thinking. So, by the way, when you see a Scalia clerk on, on TV saying, oh, I clerk for Scalia, and let me say all these great things about you know, Joe Biden, he was a counterclerk. Trust me. Oh, they get they get their media. And some of my friends, but when they say, oh, I'm a Scalia clerk, and I'm gay, and I was, you know, transgender, whatever it is, right? They were the counterclerk. And just, just know, Ginsburg hired a couple counter clerks also, not as many as Scalia. And maybe unfortunately, the current court, it's all right left. There's, there's no cross pollination. The chief sometimes hires a lot of moderates. He's probably the closest, but there's no one like, like Thomas will not hire, like, I consider him a spy, right? I don't want to his chambers. He would not allow that to happen, you know, for who could plant or something. Um, but yeah, back in the day, but, 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 you know, if you're in a state bench, Try to find a judge you think you'll get along with and have a good philosophical bend with. And it becomes a mentor for life. It's a really good thing to have. I, I clerked for a federal district court judge for two years and then an appellate judge for one year in the Sixth Circuit. And yeah, those were amazing jobs. I, I, I always think back fondly. Then I, I started teaching after I finished clerking. So I never, I was never a lawyer, by the way. I never, never actually did any. I kind of did. But never worked for a law firm more than a few weeks. Some are associates. You, know, you just take a dinner and just nice things. Okay, what else? Yes. Sorry, I have another question. For people that are preparing to clerk on the state board, how should they go about, like, what, what steps or, you know, materials and resources would you recommend to them um, in terms of preparing to be? Well, it's funny that you ask, because why am I in Phoenix? Tomorrow, I am giving a presentation to a group called Jurislink. Where I'm putting on a workshop for incoming state clerks. It's an all day workshop. I'm there, Eugene Bollock there, Justice Clint Bollock's there. Uh, I think Ross Cooperman is there, and we're teaching clerks. So I'm doing a two-hour session tomorrow morning, unless the president stops me, on how to do statutory interpretation. And it's called JurisLink, uh, J-U-R-I-S-L-A-N-K. Uh, the, the registration is closed because the, the session is tomorrow, so it's already too late. But definitely for next year, check it out. It's a really good program. Actually, this is the first one ever, so I hope it's good. I think it's going to be good. Uh, they pick a beautiful time to be in Phoenix. Um, uh, but it's a very worthwhile program. Uh, the Heritage Foundation also does a clerkship academy uh, for incoming federal clerks, which I also teach at. Uh, and that's like 70 or 80 clerks every year. I do a, actually a three hour workshop on textualism. It's, it's very, very intense. I think it's actually a lot of fun. Um, I think Pepperdine does one as well. Uh, I went to that when I was in law school. It's like, I think it's, it's like a weekend retreat in Malibu for incoming law clerks. Uh, and it does also very effective. There's a lot of training you can do. Uh, read Scalia Garner's book, all of them, just cover to cover. Uh, on precedent, uh, uh, reading law, on uh, textual, just read those books cover to cover. Uh, you, you will never, you will never find that to be a bad use of your time because it'll come back to you. Oh, that's like Scalia and Garner. There's just so much good stuff you can find there. Okay, what else? Yes, sir. Oh God! So my, my last name. Yeah, I'll show you the spelling. Um, uh, the, my last name is spelled M A N. Justice Harry Blackman spelled M U N. And my name is misspelled all the time, and it's so annoying because Justice Blackman was perhaps most liberal member of the court, close to it. He wrote Roe v. Wade. Otherwise, I don't agree with him on nearly anything. Uh, we have no relation. Uh, he's from Minnesota. I'm Jewish, right? So there's there's no. <laughs> You're Jews in Minnesota, but that he wasn't one of them. Um, he worked at the uh, at the at the Mayo Clinic, um, you know. But it's just annoying because like I, I once got cited by the Seventh Circuit, which is great, and they misspelled my damn name, and I got it fixed. So so to credit to the clerk of the court, I, they actually fixed it, uh, you know. But I get my name misspelled a lot, but it's okay. There are two Justice Whites. There are two Justice Jacksons. There are two Justice Robertses. Lord help us to sue Justice Blackman's. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? I think we're done. Thank you all so much.